Hello. Thank you for your interest in becoming a Brevard Public School Substitute Teacher. Today, we are going to discuss instructional strategies for engagement. Instructional strategies meet all learning styles and the developmental needs of all learners. Teachers equipped with well-rounded activities increase student learning opportunities. By the end of this presentation, you will understand instructional learning strategies, you will gain knowledge of why teachers use engaging strategies, and you will learn 17 engaging strategies to take to the classroom and use immediately when you are subbing. In education, student engagement refers to the degree of attention, curiosity, interest, optimism, and passion that students show when they are learning or being taught which extends to the level of motivation they must learn and progress in their education. Why is active learning so important? Active learning is a process whereby students engage in activities such as reading, writing, discussion, or problem solving that promote analysis, synthesis, and evaluation of class content. Why is active learning so important? It is important to tailor instruction to meet the individual needs of learners. If we can't provide engaging activities, it will be difficult to get learners involved. Students will learn and retain at least 70% of what has been taught if they are participating in an engaging activity. Without engaging activities, learning falls to around 50% and less than 20% is retained after two weeks. William Glasser was an American psychiatrist. He created choice theory in education. It provides an intrinsic model of teaching and learning that is focused on increasing students' self-understanding and their ability to evaluate their choices and schoolwork for quality and effectiveness. William Glasser writes that we learn 10% of what we read, 20% of what we hear, 30% of what we see, 50% of what we both see and hear, 70% of what we discuss with others, and 80% of what we experience personally. Now, let's take a look at the information from William Glasser compared to the cone of learning. Passive learning has the lowest yield on students' retention of information. The base of the cone shows that doing a dramatic presentation Simulating the real experience or doing the real thing has the greatest yield on learning with a 90% retention rate after two weeks. We are going to look at one more piece before we move into some strategies. In the 1950s, American educational psychologist ben Benjamin Bloom developed a taxonomy of educational objectives, which has been named Bloom's Taxonomy. Each of Bloom's cognitive domains enabled educators to begin differentiating the type of content being taught, as well as the complexity of the content. If we study the pyramid, we notice the bottom is recall facts and basic concepts. It is the remember domain. This actually has only a 10% retention rate for remembering what we have learned. In reality, this is a flipped pyramid when compared to the cone of learning. Effective learning environments should be filled with experiences for students. They should have an opportunity to practice what they are learning and infuse it with their past and create new experiences. Students need the basic concept about a subject before they can apply their knowledge. We want to move students from rote memorization to creating by delivering appropriate assignments and assessments during each stage of the learning process. Next, we will watch a short video about Bloom's taxonomy. Hello and welcome to Teachings in Education, Bloom's Taxonomy, explained for classroom educators. Now, before we begin, Let's give some credit to Benjamin Bloom who created the taxonomy. And this taxonomy was later revised by Lauren Anderson. Now here's the question posed. Why should educators use Bloom's taxonomy? 
Well, Bloom's taxonomy helps educators develop critical thinking skills and higher order cognitive abilities in their students. The best education is one where students are challenged. Next, what purpose does Bloom's taxonomy serve for educators? To provide a framework or organization for classifying lesson objectives, teachers can build their lessons through Bloom's taxonomy, for example. Now, let's specifically see how we can use Bloom's taxonomy. The first thing you want to do is consider the level of your students and the course level. A lesson for an algebra special education class will be different from an algebra advanced placement class. Aim to reach objectives for analyzing for remedial classes and evaluation for advanced placement classes. So, what are the levels of Bloom's taxonomy? The lowest level of cognitive rigor requires students to remember, apply, followed by analyze, followed by evaluate, and lastly, create the highest level of cognitive rigor. Now remember was first known as knowledge, but later revised. Similarly, understand was previously called comprehension. And lastly, the order of create and evaluate were switched. Bloom's taxonomy is actually a hierarchy where students must first master the lower levels before mastering the higher levels. The lower levels are relatively simple levels while the higher levels represent more complex cognitive rigor. The higher levels are more abstract as well. When utilizing Bloom's taxonomy as educators, descriptive verbs have been made available to help educators plan lessons. Verb tables have been created to align with levels of Bloom's. Arrange, describe, order, name, memorize. Those particular verbs are used to set objectives for remember level, explain, summarize, paraphrase, infer, discuss, are all aligned with understanding. Breakdown, calculate, model, subdivide, infer, are all aligned with analyze. Critique and judge are aligned with the evaluation level. And lastly, generate, plan, and produce are aligned to the top levels of cognition, which is create. Now, to summarize what we have learned thus far, to develop critical thinking in students, educators use Bloom's descriptive verbs to write lesson objectives, which are aligned to different levels of Bloom's taxonomy. So, thank you for watching this video. And I would really appreciate it if you subscribe to this channel and if you like the video as well. Thank you very much and please subscribe. Engage students. What does it look like, sound like, and feel like? Here are just a few things that you might see if students are engaged and participating in active learning. If the students are engaged, they will be active learners. You would see their eyes on the speaker or on their paper. Students would be participating, possibly involved in demonstrations, and using creativity. You would hear on-topic conversations. You might hear movement with the students being actively involved, and students could be teaching others. Plus, there would be respectful conversations. You would feel that students are engaged, they are supportive, and they are active. Framing the learning is an instructional strategy to assist with setting the plans in place prior to the activities. You want to explain to the students what they need to know and what they are able to do. Then you would clarify 
why students need to know the information. You would delineate the activities and assessments students will experience. Articulate how students will demonstrate learning and criteria for assessment. And you could provide models for process and products. Providing the agenda by writing the daily schedule or activities on the board also assists with helping frame the learning. You could include it in unit overview packet if you are going to be there for a while and link the agenda to the learning outcomes. Framing the learning is typically done at the beginning of a lesson. Framing the learning usually includes communicating the mastery objective or learning goals to the students, engaging the students in the essential question, connecting the learning to the big ideas of the unit, going over the agenda, and activating students' prior knowledge. Below in the chart are some points for the beginning, during, and the end of a lesson. This can be done over multiple days, or it could be for the lesson for the day. Here is some vocabulary for cooperative learning strategies. Shoulder partner would be turn to your side or to your shoulder and talk to the person next to you. A face partner would be the person across from you that you would have a conversation or discussion with. Response boards are typically white boards that students use to show you the answer all at one time. And then attention getters are sounds or claps or cheers that you might use to gather the class's attention. We're about to teach you a tool that is essential for fun, effective group management. I'm talking about the attention getter. These are used to get groups to stop what they're doing and focus. I'm going to let my good friend Coach Sean show you how it works in action. <laughs> if you need my voice, clap twice, clap once, clap zero times. All right, if you need my voice, match me, match me, match me. Hands on top. Now we stop. If you need my voice, show me your waterfall fingers. Bump, bada, bump, bump. Bump, bump. to determine if attention getters are already in place and how they are implemented. If the teacher does not have attention getters already established and you choose to use them, you first need to explain to the students the attention getter what your expectations for the response would be. Then you need to model the attention getter and practice until it is completed correctly. Now we are going to discuss lesson kickstarters or graphic organizers that you can use in any classroom. These are ideas that take just a plain piece of paper that you can draw out, write out, fold, and utilize if you do not have enough work to do in the class that you are subbing in, or if you need to add extra material to the class that you are subbing in, or you see somebody is done early. This is a KWL chart. 
you want to know what does the student know already about the topic, what do they wonder about this topic, and after completing the project, what have they learned about the topic. This would be used typically for nonfiction text, science, social studies, and some math activities you could use this for also. Again, this would be simple to use a blank piece of paper, do a trifold, write no, wonder, and learned at the top, and they could complete this as you go through the assigned activity. A Venn diagram is used to compare two objects. In the out part of the circle, you would write about the individual topic. In the inner circle, you would write what they have that is similar. On the next slide, I have an example of one. This is used for favorite TV shows. Liz likes NCIS, Masterminds, and Friends. Mike likes Shockwave, History Channel shows, Mega Disasters, Family Guy, Stand Up Comedy, Insider, and TMZ. In the middle, they both like Numbers, The Office, CSI, Monk, MASH, House, and News. On the outside of the circles is Grey's Anatomy, Simpsons, and Wheel of Fortune, and that is because neither of them liked those three shows. So again, this is just a sample of how a Venn diagram would be used. The Freyer model is a type of graphic organizer that uses a four-square model to determine clarity and analyze word meaning and structure. The Freyer model focuses on studying one word at a time. The selected word to focus on is written in an oval in the middle of a page or chart paper. Each of the four squares is blank and has a heading at the top. The headings or labels on the top of each square include a variation of the words definition, attributes, characteristics, synonyms, examples, and antonyms or non-examples. Photographs or illustrations may also be added to help visualize the word. The Freyer model is created based upon the knowledge, prior knowledge, or previous experiences of a person's life. Making connections increases comprehension and vocabulary development. On the next few slides, we are going to look at samples of Freyer models. Here are three examples of a Freyer model. The one on the top left is a math y-intercept is the vocabulary word. The bottom middle is for English language arts and the word is historical fiction. On the top right hand side, the word is growth or creativity and it is for growth mindset. You can see on this one, they included examples from one's own life, non-examples, and they also included a Venn diagram, which we discussed earlier. Here are two Freyer models for elementary and primary. So the one on the left is for prime numbers. Again, it gives the definition, the characteristics, examples, and non-examples. The one on the right is for colossal. It includes the definition, an illustration, examples, and non-examples. A Y chart is a procedure that is used to brainstorm ideas on what you know about a topic. By writing or drawing about what the topic looks like, sounds like, and feels like, it links into our feelings and challenges students to think outside the square. It is a great tool for planning writing as it allows students to think about the characters deeply. Again, this is another tool with a piece of paper. You draw the Y and then label. Sounds like, looks like, feels like. 
Here are some examples of Y charts in use. On the bottom left hand side, you have natural disasters. What does it feel like, look like, sounds like? In the middle, you have active listening. This is something that you could brainstorm and work on with the students prior to them doing their Y chart for their activity. On the right hand side, you have what independent reading looks like, sounds like, feels like. So again, this is a brainstorming activity in which you write about the topic. This is a vocabulary foldable that can be used for all grade levels and content areas. It is another way for students to process important vocabulary within a unit. It is created by taking a piece of paper, folding it in half, and then folding it multiple times again to create the lines to cut where the dotted lines are. You would write the vocabulary words on the outside along with a picture. On the inside, you would use the vocabulary word in a sentence along with the definition. It provides multiple means of representation, options for language and symbols, plus clarifies vocabulary and symbols. Concept mapping. Some people learn better by seeing a visual representation of what is being taught. Concept maps help students to start with a main idea and then branch out to important key concepts. This is done by using shapes like circles or squares that are connected by lines that branch out to related ideas. This type of graphic organizer is often used by teachers to illustrate new ideas, but it can also be used to assess how well students understand what they, are, they have been taught. To do this, students are shown examples of concept maps and then are given the opportunity to construct their own map illustrating their understanding of the subject. We will watch a short video on creating concept maps. How to create a concept map. What is a concept map? A concept map is a visual way to organize thoughts and make connections between ideas. How can I use a concept map? You can use a concept map to brainstorm and organize ideas, create an outline for an assignment, or test your knowledge and review for exams. How do I make a concept map? By following these seven steps. Step 1. Start by identifying the main topic and brainstorm everything you know about it. Use all relevant content from lectures, texts, and other course material. Step 2. Organize your information into main points. Step 3. Start creating your map. Begin with your main topic, then branch out to major points and supporting details. Step 4. Review your map and look for more connections. Use arrows, symbols, and colors to show relationships between ideas. Step 5. Include details. Definitions, equations, and diagrams are all useful. Step 6. Analyze and improve your map. Ask yourself, how do these ideas fit together? Have you made all necessary connections? Is the map accurate, logical, and detailed? Step 7. As you learn more, update your concept map to reflect your better understanding. Try talking out loud about your concept map. Ask yourself, can I describe the connections between these ideas? Following these seven simple steps will allow you to create a concept map to help you study. For more information, get in touch. What is it? One of the four parts of the year. The concept is season. Then it shows the examples, winter, summer, spring, fall. It is used in a sentence. What is it like? And then an illustration. Again, you can see that this is done on a piece of paper 
It can be created quickly for students to apply what they have learned or what they are learning. Here is an example of a concept map at a higher level. Analyze the value of wildlife corridors on frogs and developed landscapes in Australia. Graffiti can be used as a cooperative learning strategy or as an independent activity. Graffiti promotes the development of various learning skills, brainstorming, logical reasoning, recall of facts, and being sensitive to the views of others. It also can encourage students to stimulate and rely on the four primary approaches towards learning, such as observation, analysis, imagination, and feeling. The use of symbols, shapes, colors, images, and statements allow students to visualize the information and create vibrant displays of their thoughts and perceptions. It motivates students who are creative and shy to actively participate and express their feelings. Here is an example of magnetism and electricity graffiti. The student wrote information that they knew and facts that they could recall. Here are two other examples of graffiti where the students wrote down everything that they knew. And finally, here is a reading graffiti of favorite books where multiple students gathered together and just listed their favorite books. Again, these are ideas that can be used if you have completed all of the work left by the teacher, or if you need extra work for some students, or if you are looking for more activities to keep students engaged. Hand signals allow students to engage both verbally and non-verbally. Conversations that use them can be more inclusive. Teachers can post the hand signals in the classroom or share them so that the students can easily refer to the visual reminder. We are going to watch a video on two different ways hand signals can be used in the classroom. Discussions in a physical classroom are tricky to manage, and conducting them by video adds a whole new level of complexity. Good discussions are inclusive, equitable, and respectful. An agreed-upon set of hand signals can reduce interruptions, allow more time to consider ideas, and provide a safe space that engages all learners. A pinky and thumb extended indicates agreement with the speaker. A single index finger expresses disagreement. One fist on top of the other shows that a student wants to build on what a classmate is saying. A raised pinky finger lets everyone know the student has a question. Making air quotes shows that a student can paraphrase a quote or concept. Students can use them to participate non-verbally, indicate when they want to speak, and how they'd like to contribute. At the beginning of every discussion, it helps to configure your screen so your view includes as many students as possible at one time. Review the hand signals so they are fresh in everyone's minds. Encourage students to use the signals to show they are engaged in the conversation, whether they plan to speak or not. Reinforce the importance of both speaking and listening by acknowledging nonverbal and verbal participants by name. With a little bit of practice, these hand signals can boost engagement and make for more equitable discussions by allowing more students to participate in ways that feel comfortable for them. We're gonna do a quick little number talk. Faces forward. And if you could put your fist at your belly, please. Everybody's fist at their belly. In every classroom, there are a few kids whose hands will go up every second. So this teacher has figured out a way by having a subtle signal 
to be able to encourage participation from larger numbers of kids in the class. Everybody have fists to their belly. I don't want kids raising their hands. Some kids think faster than others, but that doesn't mean that the kids that aren't as fast don't understand. They could be processing slower, they could be looking at it in a different way. Uh, there are multiple reasons. With raising of the hands, as soon as kids see that person who's very fast at answering a question, the rest of the kids say, hmm, that's great, I don't need to anymore, I don't need to worry about that. We're gonna do a percentage talk. If you even have an entry point into the problem, something to contribute to the problem, you're gonna put your thumb up, okay? So I started by putting a problem on the board. So about a minute to think, and then as soon as you have some kind of something to contribute, your thumb is going up. She'll say fist out of the belly, and then when you know the answer, or you have a clue like how to get the answer, so you put your thumb up. And I'm looking for those thumbs. It changes the mood. Her classroom's a good environment. I feel like I'm open to give my opinion in anything. See some thumbs up. Okay, can somebody help me with the entry point over on that side? So I know that half of 160 is 80. That's 50 percent. Abdi. Oh, 10 uh, percent is 16. How do you, how do you know that? You need instructional strategies and routines that allow everybody an entry point, particularly at the beginning of the class. If you have something where the kids are feeling like, oh, you know, this is great. Oh, I participated today. I contributed something today. And then they go on to their next task. You have them a little bit more than you would otherwise. 50% is 80, 25% is 40. So what did we do with the 50% and the, and the 25%? You add. You're adding it. By having this more subtle so, signal, this teacher is encouraging participation from people who might be reticent and enabling many more children to participate in a discussion. To get 25%, you have to divide 50 by 2. see how using hand signals can engage students in a nonverbal activity. You need to review the plans that have been left to see if hand signals are already implemented. Always review the expectations and practice the hand signals that you will be using. Direct instruction is a teacher-directed teaching method. This means that the teacher stands in front of a classroom and presents the information. The teacher gives explicit, guided instructions to the students. We are going to review methods on how to implement direct instruction. The 10-2-2 direct instruction method is where you would lecture for 8 to 10 minutes and stop at a natural stopping point. You would give students two minutes to reflect or recall information presented review notes, write down questions, etc. You could allow them two minutes to discuss the information with a shoulder partner to fill in gaps and help with explanations. And then you would ask questions before moving on. The 10 2 allows for the students to have that time to process the information and reflect on what they have learned. With direct instruction, you need to allow time for students to stop and chew on it. It allows students to clear their working memory and receive new information. This type of learning involves understanding, comprehending, digesting, and verbalizing. Working memory can only hold a limited amount of information, not usually beyond 10 minutes. These are also called stop structures or processing structures. Now we are moving into the cooperative learning strategies and reviewing how they can be implemented. Many classrooms engage in cooperative learning strategies on a daily basis. By learning about the cooperative learning activities and vocabulary, 
you will have a better understanding of the expectations left by the teacher. Plus, you will be able to use the activities and strategies if you feel comfortable and time permits. In today's lesson, we're going to take a look at more applications of exponential functions. Have a quick peek at our roles and our groups. Every day in class, we are assigned a table group. We get to work with a bunch of different people. We're going to go ahead and randomize you guys here. And you're assigned roles. Scribe. The scribe is the person who's writing down what you're thinking. The speaker is the one who's presenting your information. The inquirer is someone going up to our teacher whenever your group has a question. And then the manager, they're in charge of the materials and making sure that everyone is on task. And then we need to write a key at the top. Our teacher is walking around the room and seeing how we're collaborating. Nice. And then at the end, he calls on different groups. The simple interests had more money in the accounts. Yeah. When we're doing assigned roles, everyone is involved in answering a problem. That definitely helps making sure that you can grasp concepts. After viewing the video on cooperative learning, I just want for you to reflect that cooperative learning cannot be utilized in all classrooms. Again, we are giving you tools that you can take and use when needed, but it is not expected for you to use all of these. With the cooperative learning, there are specific roles that are assigned for students to engage in. The scribe writes down the information for the group, the speaker presents their findings, the inquirer asks the teacher questions, and the manager tracks materials and tasks. You can also assign other jobs, such as the encourager that keeps everybody motivated and working hard, the timekeeper that would keep track of the time that has been spent on the task, making sure that they are staying within the allotted time specified by the teacher, With cooperative learning, you would have set responsibilities and expectations. Again, you are not expected to do this as a sub. These are just strategies that you can use if you feel comfortable doing so. Here are some guidelines that are typically used. Everyone must contribute. Everyone must listen to others. Everyone must encourage group members to participate. They need to each check for understanding, and they must stay on task. In the video, the teacher was able to assign groups utilizing a random assignment. You could do it in a classroom by counting off or by having them complete it at assigned tables or uh, preferred activities. There are multiple ways to utilize cooperative learning. And as we move through the next few slides, we are going to talk about some more instructional strategies that have students interacting with one another and lots of conversation. These responsibilities and expectations can be used during the following activities also. Write, pair, share can be used with the 10 to 2 model. Students write their response on an index card, a piece of paper, a post-it note, wherever you explain for them to do so. Then they would pair with a partner. It could be a shoulder partner, a face-to-face -face partner, an assigned partner, or a random partner they choose. Then they share their answers with each other. It could also be that they share their answers out loud with the full class as well. If you want authentic learning to occur, this should be timed and structured with the expectations explained ahead of time. Think pair share is similar to the write pair share, except students do not have to write this time. You, the teacher would ask a critical question and give students time to think about it. The students then think quietly 
about the topic or question for a set amount of time. The student pairs up with a specific partner, shoulder partner, face-to-face, -face, assigned partners, however you choose. And again, it needs to be timed for authentic learning purposes. Quick Writes is another activity that can be used with the 10 to 2 or as an independent activity to fill in time or to um, give extra work to those who are completing quickly. Here are some ideas for Quick Writes. For, with personal connections, you can have students reflect on what went well and what challenges they have faced. You can use that for group discussion. You can assess students' knowledge, giving them two minutes to write about a word with their emotions, feelings, thoughts, or stories. You can use it for summarizing reading, a quick two-minute write about what they have learned, the main idea of the article, or information they found intriguing. Promote reflection. Provide a prompt after a selected reading. You can encourage critical thinking. Have the students choose one of the statements, then decide if they agree or disagree. They would state their position clearly and defend the point of view with one specific detail. You could also use it as a pre-writing activity by having them make predictions, inferences, and hypotheses. So quick writes can be used for many different um, strategies in the classroom, and it does not need to be formal. It can be on sticky notes, blank papers, um, anything that you see fit to include at that time and with what you are comfortable doing. Round Robin is more of a speaking activity. The teacher poses a question or reflects on the teaching. The question posed has multiple possible responses or solutions. You provide students with seat time, 30 seconds to about two minutes based on the complexity of the question. Then students take turns stating responses or solutions. Round Robin can be time controlled or open, but the group rule must be that everyone in the Round Robin group must respond. Time controlled responses provide the highest level of individual accountability and equal participation. You could choose to do round robin as teams or you could do it whole class depending on your comfort level. Some examples for round robin are what makes a good listener, list objects that float, what clubs or societies are you a member of, and what is one of your favorite movies. You could also tie this to the teaching for the day. The next video that we will watch reviews information that we have already covered during this presentation and transitions into the next set of engaging strategies that we will learn.
activating strategy similar to a KWL that we learned about earlier. Students give three things they believe they already know about a subject, two things they would like to learn more about, and finally, one question that is related to the overall concept they will be learning about. 321 can be used for an entrance ticket, a pre writing activity, interacting with nonfiction, or interacting with fiction. You could also use this as an exit slip for the day where they wrote about three things that they learned, two things they still have a question about, and their favorite activity for the day or what they thought was most important that they learned. Again, these are ideas of activities that you can use while subbing in the classroom. They are not expected. They are just good instructional strategies that can be implemented with a single piece of paper. Exit tickets are quick, easy, and informative ways to allow students to feel secure and often more comfortable about sharing their thoughts. Exit slips help teachers understand what students learn and if they are having trouble. Teachers can then adjust instruction to better meet students' level of understanding or to challenge them. Exit tickets can also be used to monitor whether students were participating during the day, if they were actively involved, and if they understood the concepts that were being taught. Create Your Card is an exit ticket using a simple index card. On the front, the student would design a question based on something they learned today. On the back, they would write the answer. Of course, the student's name would need to be included on the index card. You could either choose to collect it on the way out the door, or if time permitted, you could have the students uh, pair with a shoulder partner or face-to-face -face partner and um, share their card with that partner. Again, this depends on time and how comfortable you are with that much conversation in the classroom. One minute quick writes can be done on a post-it note, an index card, or a piece of paper. You give the student one minute to identify what they thought the most confusing point of class was or to voice a question that was not answered in class. It can also be used to write down what they thought was the most important activity during the day. Responses do not need to be graded. It can be used for participation points. You could also write a quote on the board and have the student respond on a post-it as to what word or sentence in the quote spoke to them. Again, this is just a one minute time filler that you can use if you find that you are have completed the assigned work before the time allotted. What stuck with you today is another exit slip. You can write on the board what stuck with you today, give each student a post-it note, and have them write down one idea of what they thought was important or what they are leaving with remembering for the day and just stick it underneath your words on the board. We have reviewed many instructional strategies today. Below is a list of all of the ones that we have discussed and had samples of. Please know that we do not expect you to use each one of these strategies. You can choose what works best for you when you go into a classroom. We want to remind you that when you go into the classroom, you are to follow the teacher's lesson plans. These activities can be used if you find that you did not have enough work for the students to do, or if you have those students that are completing quickly and need more work to keep them engaged. This could also be used for when you are in there for a long period of time, multiple days, or if you are doing small groups, there are different activities that you can use. 
Instructional strategies will not be perfect fit for every situation. You must adapt at evaluating which strategy will be best fit for you and for the classroom. Attached to this presentation are also copies that you can use. If you did not want the students to have to draw it or create it, you can also print the copies and keep them in a binder for when you go to schools and sub that, so that you have references to use on a dot cam or to draw on the board. In closing, thank you. Thank you for taking the time to view the instructional strategies presentation. Thank you for applying to be a substitute teacher in Brevard Public Schools.